And hello from Samsara, six miles off the French coast. You can just see it over my shoulder there. In a totally flat calm. I mean, there is literally no wind at all. And the lovely thing is, uh, it's not even a big swell. So I'm just sitting here in the sun, going absolutely nowhere. I'm supposed to be going from Le Sable de Lond to Belle Isle, but heaven knows how long it might take. So I thought we could use the time profitably to talk about books, because there are now quite a few of them. This, would you believe, is I think what they call my oeuvre, um, the collection. So let's just go through them. Obviously, the, the first one to talk about is um, Old Man Sailing. Now, this was the first big success. And the story is that when COVID came along, I was in Lowestoft and I suddenly heard on the radio that the people who were over 70 were supposed to go home and shield and not go out. It was terrible fuss when Jeremy Corbyn went to the House of Commons and he was 70. Well, I'm 72. Well, I was 70 also, <laughs> and um, I wasn't supposed to go out. And I thought, well, I'm not going to stand for that. And then I heard that the French authorities had actually banned all types of pleasure boating. So if you found in any kind of pleasure craft, you would get arrested. And they weren't opening bridges or lock gates. And I thought, crikey, what happens if the British do the same? I'm going to get stuck here. So that very day, I panicked and I just left and got to myself the right side of the bridge in Lowestoft. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do? And the first thought was just go and sit in a nice little bay somewhere and, and isolate myself. But um, all the places I thought of going, the local authorities were saying, please don't come with your camper vans and your boats and your second homes because our little hospital can't cope. And so I thought, well, the only thing to do is to get 12 miles offshore and then I'll be out of, you know, jurisdiction and I can do what I like. Well, the problem is you can't stay 12 miles offshore if you go down through this, the Dover Strait because it's only 22 miles wide. On one side, the French would arrest me. On this, the other side, the British would tow me into Dover to serve out my lockdown. But I thought, well, I'd better go the other way. So I went over the, up the North Sea, over the top of the Shetlands and down the Atlantic. And I had this sort of vague plan that I was going to do a sort of figure of eight around the Azores and the Canaries and then come back in about three months when it was all over. So I had enough food for a hundred days. And uh, what happened in fact was that when I got to 200 miles of the Azores, I blew out the mainsail. I mean, I totally destroyed it. There was really nothing left. And so I would need a new mainsail. And I thought the prospect of getting one delivered to the Azores with lockdown there was just a nightmare. So I thought well, I better go back to the UK and, and pick it up in Falmouth. So I came back. And I was sitting in Falmouth waiting for the mainsail. And uh, Jeremy Vine came on his Radio 2, BBC Radio 2 show, and started talking about lockdown coming to an end and what people would miss. And so I sent in an email saying, well, I missed the whole thing anyway. I went sailing and they read it out. The next morning, the BBC rang up and said, well, I do a 10 minute interview with Jeremy. So we did the 10 minute interview. You can hear it incidentally, it's on my blog. But um, the result was that by midnight that night, my blog, which at that time had about 60 subscribers, had 44,000 hits and the WordPress site actually crashed under the onslaught. And then something else happened. The next day, the BBC rang up and said, we've got this literary agent who wants your phone number. Is it all right to give it out? Well, honestly, I mean, how much do I have to pay you to give my number to a literary agent? Don't be so stupid. Okay, so the literary agent said, well, if you can write a book really quickly, I reckon I can find a publisher. So I wrote the book really quickly, about six weeks sitting in the cities and uh, sent it off to him. And he said, oh yeah, that's good. He sent it to publishers, five of them. And they all said the same thing. They all said, hey, we love the book. It's great, it's great. Now, who is this fellow? Is he a disgraced politician? Is he a Premier League footballer, contestant on Love Island or something? Uh, no, he's just a bloke. And then they all said the same thing. They said, well, well, if he's just nobody, then not much we can do. So uh, at this point, I had the book and no publisher. So I published it myself on Amazon because you can do that. And people started buying it. 
and people still started leaving nice reviews and stars and all that sort of thing. And two years later, it has now sold 10,000 copies. And of course, the more successful it becomes, the more Amazon plugs it. And it's now selling more in America than it is in Europe. But interestingly, it's not selling in France because the French don't buy books in English. And yet the French are the biggest sailors in the world. They adore their single-handers. They revere them. Can't really tell the difference between single-handed sailors and, and, you know, supreme beings. So, um, we had to have it in French, didn't we? So here it is. It's called Le Vieil Homme Miss La Ville. La Voile, sorry. Um, and that actually literally means the old man hoists the sail because the translator, Christian Kalianis, who is normally a translator of poetry, said that it was a better title. It was going to be uh, Le Vieil Homme Qui Navigue, which is literally the old man who sails. But there we are, we've, uh, we've got that title. And the narrator who's doing the audible edition, uh, he's Philippe, uh, sorry, Olivier Piquet in Montreal. He can't believe it. He, he says, this, this is amazing. This is like poetry, this is Balzac. And I mean, I wouldn't know, but he seems to think it's amazing. So there you are. If you have French friends or you speak French yourself, that is the, that's the book. Um, and incidentally, if you like these books, please do leave them some Amazon stars. Those are so important. And I'm trying to get all the five stars lit up. At the moment, I've got four and a half lit up uh, because it's, what, 4.6 stars, and they can't actually differentiate between a half a star and a whole one. So if I can get it to 4.8, then that would light them all up. That would be great. Meanwhile, what have we got? The next one, The Voyage. The Voyage number one. Uh, notice it says uh, BVIs to Falmouth. Now, what this is all about is that I was in the West Indies and I had to come back to the UK because that first trip to, over there was really just a trial run to see what I needed. And uh, I wondered if I wrote something every day and I had a voyage of 3,000, 4,000 miles, maybe there would be enough for a book. So that's what I did. And people <laughs> love it. They say it's, it's very funny. You know, it's very quirky because it's just one old man on a tiny little boat in the middle of nowhere for an awfully long time. And, and it's gone down very well. In fact, um, that sells better at the moment than Old Man Sailing, I believe. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, so that's that one. Then what have we got? Ah, the good stuff. Now, this is, uh, is kind of unusual because what happened was when I left newspapers, they gave me all these cuttings about, you know, Tiananmen Square and the Iron Curtain coming, falling, sorry, the Berlin Wall falling down and, and all the places I'd been as a foreign correspondent. And I threw them all away. But I kept all the stuff I'd written for yachting magazines or newspapers about sailing. And there was quite a lot of it. And I read it through as I was going across the Atlantic. And I thought, do you know, this is, this is good stuff. Well, actually, that's why it's called It's Good Stuff, because the editor of Yachting, One, uh, Yachting World, um, Andrew Bray, uh, he was the one who commissioned me to do a, a monthly column in Yachting World, and it ran for 10 years. And that's an awful lot of columns. And after a while, I sent him an email saying, look, it's getting a bit silly. I'm writing, I was writing about knickers and you know, all sorts of things. And he said, no, keep it up, it's good stuff. So we called it the good stuff. And there was too much of it for one book. So there is a second volume. And the interesting thing about this is this is the whole story of my sailing life from my late twenties when I had little amicus and started writing for yachting magazines through to getting Largo, doing the single-handed transatlantic race, meeting Tamsin, uh, going off to sea, having babies on the boat. It's all there chronologically. So this is the full story told as it happened. And it's, and it's quite something, I tell you. And then, 
And then we got something totally different. Now we're something completely different, as they say. Now this is a novel. And this is a novel I wrote in 1982. What had happened was that I was at the Daily Mail and they sent me down to Greenham Common to the Women's Peace Camp. Now, if you're a certain of age, age, you'll know all about this. What had happened was that the British government had told the Americans that they could have nuclear-tipped cruise missiles at their air base at Greenham Common in Berkshire. And uh, women came from all over the country, all over the world, in fact, to protest. And they, they encircled the base, which is enormous, and they lived in little sort of huts, they called benders, you know, made out of bushes and tarpaulins and what have you. And they shuffled around in Wellington boots in the mud. I remember writing, peace is hell, as if it was the First World War. But the thing about it was that it was totally peaceful. And don't forget, this was the 80s with the miners' strike, when, you know, people were being killed. In fact, I went down to South Wales and found the, stri uh, the strike-breaking miner who was in the back of the taxi when the driver was killed when they dropped a concrete fence post off a bridge and it went straight through his windscreen. So this was a very serious and violent time and yet the peace camp was totally peaceful. And I thought, this is an enormous force here. What would happen if they turned it into a political party? What would happen if that political party won a general election and then determined to do away with all the nuclear weapons. What would happen? I mean, would the military elite allow that to happen? And I thought, I've got a novel here. So I wrote the novel, sent it off to the Lawrence Pollinger Agency, who published some of my uh, children's books. And uh, they said, yeah, I think we can find a publisher for this one. And they sent it all around, and the publisher all wrote back and said, once again, the same thing. We, we like the book. It's, it's, it's pretty good, yeah, for a first novel. Um, but it's a bit far-fetched, honestly, really. Well, it was, because guess what it, it featured? It featured a Russian president interfering in other countries' elections. It had an American president with the dictum of America first and the rest of the world can go to hell in a handcart. And it had a British prime minister who wanted to scrap all nuclear weapons. And there we were, uh, it, only it, was, it wasn't published, uh, so I put it in the attic, but in 2017, I woke up one morning and there was Jeremy Corbyn saying he wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. There was President Putin interfering in elections and Donald Trump in the White House saying America first. And I thought, I've got a book about this. So I got it out of the attic and published it on Amazon. And it's still there and you can, you can buy it. And it's not the greatest thriller in the world. I won't claim that. But people have said they like it very much. It's a, certainly an interesting proposition. And it's actually rather exciting. I know this because my eldest son, who um, went to, he studied creative writing at the University of East Anglia. And so I got him to read it. And he made some very good suggestions. And uh, he said that he was very sorry because there's one chapter he hadn't really corrected properly because it was too exciting. <laughs> he had to go through it again. He still found it too exciting to actually clean, clean up all the grammar and the semicolons. So uh, I do recommend that one. And there is another one coming, but I will tell you about that when it does. And meanwhile, it is uh, it's the evening. It's 10 to 7 and there's still no wind. In fact, let's just take a look around. I'll turn the camera around. You can just see just how calm it is. And there is, I mean, I haven't even bothered to take the sails down because they're not coming to any harm, slatting or anything like that. It's just total, total calm. So it looks to me as if it's time for a cold beer out of the fridge and a little bowl of crisps. Until the next time.